and welcome to the, the third of our series in this uh, in this talk we're doing. Uh, I'll introduce uh, Jacques in a second, but I wanted to just share a little bit about, um, you know, I've talked every time about the importance of, of Leger saw the need to share information. That's We gather information, we gather insights, and we thought it was important to share throughout this. Uh, if you do not, uh, if you do not receive our weekly COVID tracker, please go to uh, the website leger360.com and you can download and that is a free uh, tracking survey that we've been doing that lets us track Canadians and Americans attitudes and views on, on the current pandemic, um, being at home, what does it mean about going back to work, what are we doing from social distancing measures and all, all aspects of COVID. Uh, we also launched, I'm going to share, and I think this leads into our talk a little bit. Um, we launched a study, and I hope you can see my screen. Like I say, it's always an adventure with technology. Um, we launched, a, um, we launched a, a quick study looking at, um, looking at uh, Canadians' behavior. So what are we doing as Canadians? What are we... Uh, uh, during the pandemic, and however, what behaviors are changing? And we found generally 18% of Canadians said they've adopted at least one new online behavior. And I think this is going to be a big part of the talk Jacques and I are going to be talking about is this, this new online experience. And 71% of Canadians who have adopted that um, feel that at least one new behavior feel they're going to continue it. So in other words, We've tried it out and it's worked for us. And if it's working for us, I am likely to continue that um, afterwards. The, um, sorry, I had a hand raised, that's interesting. Um, then, when, and then when we move forward, we're also seeing that young Canadians are adapting quicker. Uh, we are also seeing that there's a need for, and we're gonna discuss about this specifically in regards to Quebec, but I think also across all of Canada, this bi-local movement that we're seeing, um, and that Canadians are generally focused on food and health, which I don't think is that surprising, but a lot of our shopping and uh, needs are around that for this current period. So let me, um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Jacques Nattel, who is, uh, who is joining us today. Thank you, Jacques, for, uh, for being here. Just a quick little uh, introduction. Uh, Jacques is the Professor Emeritus at HEC Mon Montreal. He is the co-author of uh, at least five marketing textbooks and a number of scientific articles and journals. One of the textbooks is, of course, the uh, Cracking the Quebec Code, which uh, Jacques is a co-author with uh, Jean-Marc Leger and Pierre Duhamel, which if anyone on this phone also is doing business in Quebec and doesn't read this, this is something you should be looking at. Uh, over Jacques' academic career, he's received awards for his teaching and advancement of the marketing profession, and in 2018, the Quebec government made him a distinguished member of the Order of Excellence in Education. At HEC Montreal, he has served as Director of the Marketing Department, Director of Programs, and Secretary General. He's also acted as Chairman of the Omer Dessert's Chair of Retailing and the RBC Financial Group Chair of eMarketing. So welcome to our talk, Shock. Glad to have you with us. Thank you. How are you, how are you doing so far as part of all this uh, pandemic and staying at home? Well, I'm doing okay, but you should ask a question to my wife. She, yeah. she, she, she's the one who has all the merit. <laughs> okay. Well, and I guess we're here to talk retail. And uh, when you and I were talking the other day, you made a comment that uh, you used to see what was going to happen five years in the future. Yeah. And now you, it took five weeks to get there in some respects. So maybe you could talk a little bit about, just in general, what ways do you feel the retail industry will be changed after this? Okay, well, that's a very good question, Dave. And first uh, and foremost, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, it's an honor to uh, share one of two of my thoughts with you. Um, the first thing I'd like to mention is, is something which uh, will sound obvious, but it's, it's important to mention it. Um, retail landscape will change. Uh, it is actually changing, but it, it will change in a persistent, persistent way uh, for years to come, no doubt about it. But 
there's one thing that will not change is that consumer will still be there and consumer will still be consuming uh, because there are needs to fulfill. Uh, we might be, we will be going through a recession. Uh, things might be a little tougher, but consumer will still be around. So the question uh, for everyone to think about is that what will be the networks? What will be the channels? How will that landscape evolve? As David mentioned, mentioned David, um, uh, if I would have told you uh, three months ago where retail would be five years down the road, I would have told you it is going to be much more efficient, uh, way less investment in real estate, and way more e-commerce. Well, this is exactly what we're going through now. We are covering in two months what we would have covered in five years. Um, and as Dave mentioned, and as the survey um, shows, uh, a lot of Canadians are finding that doing business and buying things through the web is extremely efficient. Um, you got to realize that if, if, if we were to go back, let's say January 1st, about 10% of all the purchases of Canadians were through the web. Um, now, of course, it's way it's way more than that. We are, we are probably around 30 to 35 percent. What Canadians have discovered over the last two weeks and two weeks and certainly two months is that you can do a lot of your purchases through the web. It's efficient. It will be even more efficient by the time the logistic will be uh, totally fine tuned. Um, so. There's no doubt that we are not going to go back all the way where we were as long as the type of retail outlets are concerned. Uh, for any retailer to have a in to have a store, to have a physical store, you will have to um, propose a lot of added value because if it's only about the price or the product or the accessibility to the product, Canadians now have learned that you can get it through e-commerce. Right. Um, I'm going to pause for a second. If anyone has any questions, there is a question tab. Feel free to open it and, and write it through, and I will pass on the questions to Jacques while we go. Um, that being said, the fulfillment of it has to be there as well. So when we yeah. talk about almost three quarters of Canadians saying, I've tried something and I'm likely to continue it, that means that retailers must be getting something right yeah. in terms of this, or are we just giving them a lot of grace and uh, extra room to make mistakes? Like, are, are retailers getting it right in terms of uh, addressing this right now? They have to get it right. They have no choice because you have a very strong contender, and we will talk about it in a moment uh, when we'll talk about local stores and local providers. But uh, you have a very strong contender, which is Amazon, whether Amazon.com or .ca, and they've learned uh, to do things pretty well. So that's the benchmark now. Uh, a lot of consumers, and I think that it's, uh, it's, it's in the survey, a lot of consumers have tried also for local stores, especially grocery stores, uh, drug stores, and, and local products. But a lot of uh, the things that consumers are still, Canadian consumers are still buying goes through major um, players as Amazon. So they've been setting for years now the benchmark. It means that anybody who will want to fight in this arena will have to be just as strong and as, uh, as efficient. It uh, doesn't have to be just like Amazon, but you've got to be mm -hmm. efficient. One of the things, though, that a lot of retailers are, uh, are, 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 are under understanding that the understanding that they're gaining is that um, you can do pretty good business. Maybe not for all of retailers, but for a whole lot of retailers, you can do pretty good business by having a totally different revenue model. Uh, a lot of retailers are beginning to realize that the cost of their real estate is just too high. Uh, real estate for two reasons, the store itself, but the mm -hmm. fact that you have a lot of your inventories in your stores, which are prime locations. So the square foot of, that you have to pay for to keep inventories in a lot of stores can be handled in a totally, totally different way. The second thing, and we'll talk about that in a moment, 
The second thing that a lot of retailers are realizing is that the cost of your employees um, is, it, 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 it is high, not, not, not the basic salary, because we know that in retail, salaries are not very high, but the cost for retail- The overall cost of having that number of employees, yes. So unless your employees give a tremendous experience to your consumer, uh, there's no real, there's no added value anywhere for, for, for no one. And, and those are the two things that this crisis uh, is, is, is getting through as a message. Okay, so let's break that down. Let's go, let's keep with employees for a second then. So yeah. what, will, what will happen for, because there, there's a large number of unemployed uh, retail workers right now. Yeah. Are they all coming back to work or will there be a significant change in, in the employment of these people who work in retail over the longer term? That's a tough one. Um, unfortunately, I'm not convinced at all that all retailers will reopen across Canada. So by definition, you will have... You'll have some more cards. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we hope that the majority of retailers will reopen. Uh, they will most likely reopen in the manner they got shot in the first place. I mean, you probably didn't have time to revisit your revenue model in two or three months. Right. But, uh, but you have plenty of time as a retailer to think about uh, where you would like to go. So my feeling is that uh, you will, well, as, as, as retailer um, go back, you will see that employees will follow, but employees will most likely be reassigned to different tasks. Um, just like we've seen in the area of grocery stores uh, over the last few years, uh, as, as grocery stores are going more and more toward the web, the, you have a lot of employees that have changed uh, either departments or at least they're the type of function that they were served. So uh, yeah, you got to expect that you are, uh, there is going to be a, a, a reshaping of, of, of the, the job descriptions, a reshaping of most likely of the salaries and you are going to have a lot of training to do because jobs will just not be the same. Be the same. So maybe this ties into Genevieve Larocque has asked a question. You mentioned physical retailers will need to provide a lot of added value in order to compete against or effectively complement online. What do you think that value will look like for the post-COVID consumer? So what type of value could they be providing? And maybe that's what these extra employees will be doing now. Well, I think that that's a very good question. I think that essentially the the I, I was I was going to say the best added value, but I'm I, I'm going to go all the way to say the only added value when you think about it is to be able to try, taste, smell, uh, do play with the product before buying it. Uh, the experience has to be about the product, trying it, tasting it, smelling it, what not. Uh, and you don't need all of your inventory in one store or in all stores to provide that experience. But when you think about it, um, a lot of the products that we buy, we bought. So if you're buying like a box of spaghetti, uh, I mean, it is going to be pretty much the same spaghetti as you bought two weeks ago. So you don't have to go to the store to, to taste it, to try it. But there are some products that you want to buy or taste or smell or write or whatnot. Well, that's the experience. Uh, I know that we put a lot of emphasis on uh, having a nice presence, uh, being, be, being friendly to your consumer. But when you think about it, the consumer is not there for you. He or she is there for the product. So anything that you can show about the product, well, here, there you go. But think about it, Dave. You don't need any, you will not need any more 2,000 square feet store to provide that experience. Smaller store right. will do. So, okay, but if I go in and I'm thinking immediate, like six months after restrictions have been lifted, how comfortable are consumers going to be at touching and feeling and tasting and smelling the same thing that someone, 20 other people have just touched and felt and smelled before you? Do you think there'll be a bit of a transition till we get there? Will it yes. look a little bit different for a bit? Yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. This, this is a very good 
As a matter of fact, a lot of consumers were, were already reluctant to go mm -hmm. and try and smell and have experience with the product in stores. Um, but but if there's only if there were to be only one good thing about this crisis is that we are learning fast. We are learning fast about the things that we feel can enhance an experience. Um, you know, just to, 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 to provide a way for consumers to wash their hands uh, is a plus. It's something okay. that will not disappear. So don't throw away, don't throw away whatever dispenser you have. Uh, you're going to need them for, for years to come. Uh, same thing about uh, wearing uh, uh, social distanciation. You, you got to make sure that your store or cafe or restaurant will be, you know, that the layout will be uh, will be thought accordingly because those will are, are there to last. Yeah, so it makes sense. So, yeah, like when you go into the grocery store now, the first person you see is someone who gives you hand sanitizer before yeah. you're even in the store. So those types of uh, applications need to be made as we go forward. Um, I'm going to go back to the idea of physical space. Uh, yeah. You talk about smaller footprint. What's going to happen with, with shopping malls, which are a, a gathering of large numbers of people to go to a number of stores within that? How are shopping malls going to come out of this? And, and are we going to see, uh, Paulo Bernardino asks, are we going to see sort of a resurrection of the major commercial streets? which well, have been abandoned for malls. I mean, is there going to be a shift in that aspect of it as well? Well, that, that's a wonderful question. Um, shopping malls, the way we, we've been thinking about them uh, since the late 50s, uh, were already in a very bad place before the crisis. Uh, they were not going as well as they used to five or 10 years ago. This pandemic will only uh, make things worse for them. Um, shopping malls that were doing okay were sh shopping malls that were dwelling on services and entertainment. We all understand that services, whether it's air stylists or cinemas mm -hmm. or cafe, will not be back like next weekend. So unfortunately, shopping malls will hurt even more. Conversely, uh, Main streets uh, will most likely be uh, on the rise for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, the first reason is that you don't, you don't, as a consumer, you will not feel as secluded as you would have, you would be in a shopping mall. But also because there is another thing that will change, um, because you will not want to send everyone taking the subway at the same hours all jam. Uh, you will, businesses will have, and not only uh, uh, for the fall come back, but I'm convinced that it, it is going for years to come, uh, we will use much more uh, at home work, but we will also spread the, the workable hours across the day. Because of that, it is going to make an experience, shopping experience on a main street much more pleasant because mm -hmm. you are going to have less cars and it is going to be much more enjoyable to walk on those streets. If I were to invest uh, in any real estate for a retail operation, it would be much more on a street than it would be. On okay, that makes sense. Um, Mary uh, Tanos has asked, uh, obviously things are gonna change, but what about grocery stores? How do you see, and yes, some of it's gone online, but they've been essential, they're still up and running, there's been some shifts. What do you see happening to grocery stores after this? That's a very good question. Uh, if there's one sector of the retail industry that we're really moving in the right direction anyway, it's, it's grocery store. If you see the layout of major grocery stores, uh, <clears throat> whether you look at um, uh, Loblaws or Sobeys or uh, Metro or Whole Food, of course, uh, they were already going toward more and more fresh products. When you, you, you know, when, when, yep. when you enter those stores, you have those little uh, islands of products, the, 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 the stacking of, of either uh, uh, um, produce, uh, 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 vegetable, fruits, uh, fish products, meat product. And this is where consumer 
like to spend their time. It's, it's, it's enjoyable to be in that area. Uh, and then suddenly after you, 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 you've, you went around all those little islands, then you, you, you turn a corner and you're back in the old alleys where you have dry stocks, dry food, you know, spaghetti, cans, and stuff yeah. like that. If you if you look at a store, uh, any any of the major uh, banners, if you look at one of their stores that have, would have been uh, um, uh, redesigned over the last two years, two thirds of the store is in the fresh uh, department, and one third is in the um, dry department. And the dry department is pretty dull. Uh, mm-hmm. So basically, what 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 stores are progressively going toward is everything that you buy on a regular basis, which doesn't have a, you know, a lot of added value. Uh, your quart of milk, your, uh, your, your can of soups, your dry spaghetti, whatnot. Uh, this more and more is going to be delivered at home. And, and stores already there, going ranging from uh, you know, Amazon all the way to uh, uh, Walmart, down the way, all the way to Sobeys and Metro. And you keep the store for more hedonic type of consumption, uh, with of course all the safeguards that we've mentioned earlier. Okay, so we're talking about what about buy local? And to me, produce, I start thinking about buy local. And obviously, we've seen um, in Quebec there's a real strong campaign um, buy blue. I don't know the exact French phrase for it, but. Uh, uh, we're starting to see that in other provinces as well. I don't know if people are necessarily defining what local is, but there's yeah. this feel that we, I as a consumer, should think about this in my purchases. Yeah. yeah. It's always been there. Is this trend going to keep with us further, or what? What do you see? Okay. Uh, there are several things in that question. Uh, first, the interest for buy local really uh, uh, got a hype uh, when uh, when President Trump decided to uh, uh, prohibit 3M from sending masks to Canada. This, is, this, this really hurt a big, uh, st- stroke a big, uh, a big nerve across all Canada. And this is when we realized that uh, it's not a good thing for any country, for any nation, uh, to be dependent uh, from the international suppliers, whether for food or for the mask. Uh, when you realize that we cannot, in this country, make paper masks, uh, that we have to import them, uh, uh, we suddenly, as a nation, you know, as Canadian, we certainly start realizing that the pendulum wa- was just like two way to the um, uh, international uh, and globalization. So a lot of Canadians want to bring th- bring it back. Now, what will it mean in practice? It will mean in practice essentially two things. Uh, that most Canadians will want to buy local if the price is just as good. I am convinced, and I've been studying marketing for the last 42 years of my life. Um, uh, if, if the price is not there, people will just not stick to their local uh, ideals. But uh, there's another thing that uh, we will realize, though, and it's not really consumers that are realizing it, but uh, retailers themselves. Retailers now are realizing that they are extremely vulnerable if they are dependent from a very long supply chain. If, if, if your supply chain is very long, uh, you are at risk. Uh, until recently, we, we didn't pay a lot of time thinking about it because supply chains were extremely efficient. Now it's now we re- realize what it is to have a supply chain where you have like one link which is missing, and and because of that, my feeling is that a lot of retailers, especially in the uh, grocery products, will want to make sure that they can buy local because for for yeah. one thing, supply chains are shorter, so you are less at risk. Because of that, you are going to have more and more local products, and the consequence is that retailer pushing more of the local product, prices will be probably, most likely will be better, and consumer will see them, find them, will want to buy them, and you're gonna have the ball rolling. But it's not going to be on, I'm sure that it's not going to be on the basis of, I want to do my, you know, I want to do my, my contribution to the local economy. Unfortunately, by the time the economy is back, 
uh, this 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 feeling, this sentiment is going to be way back. Uh, it, it, it has to be a matter of efficiency. So, from a marketing perspective, if I'm trying to communicate about my store or my products or whatever, the buy local isn't going to be something that's going to work. Or, mm. okay, well, you have a good question. Uh, it you can almost divide the world in when it comes local. Uh, for anything which is edible, for grocery products, uh, it is the product which is the which is local, not the retailer. Okay, so if you have like local potatoes or local lobster uh, in Walmart, people will see it as being local. For all other products, or for most of the other products, um, garments, uh, uh, furniture, uh, electronic, whatnot. It's the retailer which is local, not the product. Right. So if you're selling grocery, make sure to put the emphasis on the fact that your products are local. If you're any other type of retailer, put put the emphasis on the fact that you are a local retailer and that you are part of your, your community. Okay. And is this across Canada? Yeah. 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 Okay. So one of the questions we had, and I think you just answered it, but I'm going to ask it anyways, is from Charlene Pluman. Going back to main streets, but I think it's also local businesses or whatever it is, what's the best way to capitalize on the possibility of, of local, from a, from a local business perspective or on a main street type business perspective, how do we start capitalizing on the opportunities that will, will arise from this? That's a good question. I like it. Um, it, it is very different if you're on a street than if you're in a mall. You gotta realize that malls were invented to bring people, to get people to take their car and to drive on the average about 10 kilometers, okay? So the moment you are in a conventional mall type of logic, uh, the notion of local is at best uh, coming from within the province, coming from within the country, but the, the notion of it's local, local is no longer there. Uh, now, one of the things that e-commerce have taught Canadians is that you don't have to take your car anyway to uh, take advantage of the offer that shopping mall, malls were, were making, which is we will offer you plenty of variety with low prices because you have a lot of variety with low prices on the web. And not only that, but you don't have to take your car. We will ship the product to where you are. So that's the reason why at the beginning I was telling you that shopping malls are in a real tough place. Now, it's not the same for streets because streets, by definition, are part of the community. Yeah. I, I'm not talking about uh, Young Street or St. Catherine or major streets. Uh, downtown major Canadian cities where you have a lot of tourists and you have a lot of businesses. I'm talking about neighborhood streets. Uh, those streets uh, belong to the community. Uh, so by definition, if you are a merchant, if you are a retailer on one of those streets, even if you're a banner, you have everything in your hands to, to be portrayed as a local store because you are part of a community. And this is the card that you should play, uh, not, notwithstanding what you're selling. I, of course, if you're selling yeah. a Canadian products through a Canadian banner on a Canadian street, you have it all. Yeah, okay. Um, so a couple of quick questions, a little bit different types of retail spaces. Uh, I have a question from uh, Ernie Chow. What do you think will happen to beauty salons, med medical aesthetics, meta spas, with many people able to get personal care, would the new normal be less caring on the personal looks as we work from home and WebEx be the new normal? Is it something that we're just gonna, you know, when we're ready to go back to our aesthetics place, are we just gonna be less likely to because we've experienced what it's like to not do that? Or, or do you think they will resurrect along with other retail spaces? Services? No, they will, they, they will resurrect. Uh, I uh, I mean, you just have to watch TV to see how many anchormans do have like funny hair you know, uh, to see that we, we, we need hairstylists, I mean, real hairstylists. Uh, same thing for a lot of personal services. 
what we will learn uh, in coming weeks is that there, there's a way to provide those, those services, but you will have to display all the, um, uh, all the equipment to give not only the impression, but to make sure that your client is safe. If, yeah. we're, if, if we're able to do it on a surgery room, we can do it in a, in a hair salon. There's a way to do it. Now, eventually, by the time we get a vaccine, uh, hopefully, uh, those things will probably fade away progressively. But uh, I have no doubt that it's only a matter of weeks uh, before we get there. Of course, your, um, your hairstylist or your uh, coiffeur or whatnot uh, will probably be wearing a funny costume. Uh, probably will not. You will not be able to have the type of conversation you used to have with with that person. Yeah, no, I'll be masked and you know, this. Yeah, you know, my kids are keeping track of my hair length to see uh, at what point uh, I should just stop being on any camera. Is what they've told me. By, um, by the way, Dave, uh, one of the things I've been following uh, because they they really front runners now in reopening is uh, what's going on in Georgia. And in Georgia, one of the, um, the first stores that were really, I mean, you had lineups were barbershops. Yeah. You know, so along these lines, um, one of the stores that I, that I purchased from is, is a, a shaving barber supply store in, in Calgary and in Ottawa. And they have shifted from this to doing uh, uh, online tutorials on Instagram. And I'm finding I'm now watching how to trim my beard or how to do this differently. Are you seeing some retailers taking advantage of social media like, the, yeah. like this guy, Kent of Inglewood yeah. is doing yeah. to get this? Yeah. Is that? Yeah. There's, a, there, there's a great experience I've been following uh, since the beginning of the crisis, uh, which is um, um, a barber shop uh, in, uh, as a matter of fact, it's, it's a chain in Boston. And what, what they're concerned, like a lot of retailers, was to have uh, to manage their cash flow. Uh, so right. what they what they've been doing is that fortunately they had the list of their clients. So so they've reached out to their clients and then they've reached out to more clients through social media, basically making the following offer: uh, If you are willing to pay in advance for uh, three uh, three sessions of uh, of, of or whatever, um, you will you will have uh, automatically a 25% discount. And uh, we forecast that reopening will be, I think in their case, they were forecasting reopening for May 4th. But any uh, week that uh, the confinement would be extended, you're gaining a 5% discount. So oh, wow. if, if, if stores reopen only the 11th, it's not 25%, you're going to get 30%. And so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, it, it did them well for two reasons. Uh, first, it kept them in touch with their clientele, and second, uh, it helped their cash flow. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Well, and to a certain degree, that's a bit like the buy uh, gift cards of your favorite retailers, especially yeah. your smaller retailers, to happen through them. We saw that movement at the beginning of it, and now we're seeing other movements like. Uh, uh, hashtag takeout Wednesday for restaurants to convince yeah. people to start buying locally with their restaurants. So we're seeing some of that coming into play. Um, we had promised everyone about a half hour or so, but I have a couple of questions. So for anyone still on, we're going to run through these last few questions. What about, and this is this is shifting a little bit, obviously away from aesthetics and hair salons, um, festivals, large gathering of consumers. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your opinion about do, will consumers feel confident coming back to these types of events? Can you comment on that, or is that? That's a that's a, that's a great question. I'm sure that um, most people who are listening to us uh, got through that experience where you're watching a movie on Netflix or whatnot, and you see a lot of people, you know, being like gathered somewhere in the restaurant, and suddenly you're surprised to see that yeah. it's like unusual. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, makes me feel uncomfortable to see that now when I see that on absolutely. TV. Yeah. And, 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 and we, we, we got to that type of reaction within two months. So uh, my feeling is that it's going to last for a while uh, before, before consumer, unless, unless, you know, there's kind of a miracle, you know, you have that vaccine or they find out that 
after drinking three cup of tea, you're you're cured, or you know, it, it was just an image, of course. Um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, if there's no miracle, people will still be edgy for a long time. Uh, so it, it means that uh, e e even the, the 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 way you think about um, uh, your movement in a shopping center uh, has have to have to be. Uh, you got to realize a lot of shopping center, by the way, uh, were dwelling uh, on on their um, on their entertainment uh, sector: yeah. restaurants, bar, uh, cinemas, yeah. and and theater. Uh, you will not see that for a while. Uh, I'm, I, I can bet you that, and I, and I did that little, uh, that little computation back of an envelope. Take a, take your, your average cinema, okay? Uh, unless, unless uh, you, you're going to a cinema where, you know, which is most of the time empty. If you're going to a place where, you know, there's a lot of people in the cinema or in, the, in a theater, think about the fact that by tomorrow, if you want to reopen, you will need one person per three seats, not for two, but for three seats. Uh, in some cases, for four seats. Yeah. So it means that if you're playing, if you're if you're uh, if you're uh, casting a play, uh, you got to uh, break even, at least break even, and hopefully make some profit with 25% of your yeah. clientele sitting there. Same thing for the orchestra. Same thing for a concert. Yeah, that, that's going to make a big change yep. to it. Yep. Um, so we have one more question here. It's it's you were talking about supply chains yep. a second ago. Um, we're starting to hear about what's going to happen with temporary workers coming into Canada to help with the agricultural food supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, do you do you feel that we'll, the grocery stores will have some trouble with the produce coming in because of that effect in that Canadian piece and how should we be communicating that as a grocery store to Canadians about if, if this week there's no certain product available not because people have bought it all but because of the supply chain issue yeah yeah okay that, that that's a very good question uh, rest assured that uh, uh, I, I personally I don't foresee any major shortage of, of, of food. Uh, but you're going to have shortages of some type of foods. Uh, you got to realize that actually, as as we are speaking still today, and it was the case, of course, if we roll back two months ago, uh, about 30% of the products that were that were uh, in uh, your supply chain, as long as grocery stores are concerned, were spoiled or lost or thrown away. Uh, because it was much more efficient to do so than to try to salvage them. Those, yeah. are, most of the time, those are good products. So uh, we're not near any shortage. But what you will see is uh, less uh, attractive products. You're going to have like apples, which, which are not perfectly red, because, but you're going to have apples. Um, same thing for most of the products. And as you've mentioned, some week you will go there, and, and we, we already start seeing that. Some weeks you will go there uh, to your store and you will see only two type of lettuce, not, not three or four, only two. Uh, and, and we're, we're going to cope with that. Uh, and I think personally that, that there, there might be some merit to it because that will force us to rethink about what is the real value of any supply chain. And the real value is probably to, 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 to make the most of any products that is available rather than to make like perfect product to the majority of Okay, I have one more question and I, I was gonna end it, but I really like this question. It's from uh, Mary Eve Gagne. Um, actually, I have two questions. Uh, just, we track for a client sort of Cana how Canadians are paying for things on a regular basis. And I can't wait to see the shift in results that come out of this. But do you think cash is dead? Yes. Is is it, is it, yeah, okay, that's it. <laughs> that yeah, incredible. But, that's it. But, but for a whole lot of reasons, but not, not for the reason that, that we would think right away. Uh, we would think about it right away because you don't have to touch the paper, okay? So you just have to yeah. not, you not right. even swipe, but just like touch the pad with your card. But there's a more fundamental reason is that uh, um, paper, paper money, conventional money, costs a lot to retailers to make their deposit 
but it costs a lot for governments for two reasons. First, you have to manage those coins and the, those paper, that paper, and that that's a that's a pure cost. I mean, there's no there's no benefit for any government to print cash. But there's a second reason: is that the moment the moment you get rid of cash, you get rid of black market, and in years to come, making mm -hmm. all the revenues they can. Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, all right, I'm going to ask one more question. But before we do, I want to thank everyone for coming out today and uh, and and being with us. And I want to remind you that next Thursday we're going to have Dr. Alex Sevigny. We're going to talk about the shift in social media during this. And uh, uh, Dr. Sevigny and Leger, we've been doing an 11-year study tracking the use of social media in Canada. We're going to have some updates on that and talk about what's been happening during COVID. And we've added another speaker the week after, Dr. Uh, Tina McMarkendale from the uh, Institute for Public Relations. And um, they've just done a large study looking at uh, employees and uh, how companies are communicating with those employees and how we should be talking to uh, people who work for us going forward. So an employee communications piece, that's in two weeks. But the last question is on sustainability. We saw a real trend over the last few years towards sustainable products, sustainable practices when it comes to retail. Um, it was gaining momentum and now it's shifted because, uh, for example, I go into Starbucks and I can't use my refillable mug because there's a health risk with that. So do you see this coming back afterwards or is this been enough of a shift off it that we're 10 years back? In terms of sustainability no good question no i i I see, I see it coming back because the the uh, the health issue is a temporary one it's 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 a hurting one uh we all feel bad about it but hopefully it's going to be we're going to be you know on the other side of, of, of the, like a couple of months from now but the next crisis um is a recession and, yeah. and, and recession, I've been studying them since the 1982 recession, uh, 82, 87, and so on and so forth. And every time uh, there, is, there has been a recession, consumers are turning, turning toward more durable products for one good reason, because they, they know that uh, if it, you know, whatever they, they buy, if it, if, if it breaks, if it, it's not sustainable, they will not have the money to buy another one next year. Uh, it applies to computer, but it, apply, it applies also to uh, cups that you bring to Starbucks, because if Starbucks can drop the price of their coffee, if you bring your cup, well, there is a payback for consumers. Of course. So we'll yeah. be looking for paybacks. Definitely. Jacques, thank you very much. We've used up everyone's time today. I really appreciate this. I will uh, look forward to all of this ending so we can see you uh, with no mustache for the first time in 50 years with the charity that you're doing. And, uh, and again, thank you everyone for attending and uh, I hope to see everyone back uh, next week when it's uh, Dr. Sevigny and uh, social media. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Jacques. Thanks, Thanks all. Bye.